Hey everybody, Lardy here, and today I wanted to talk about how to boss rush with Winona. I get the impression that many of you think Winona is a boring character, and not gonna lie, I kind of understand where you're coming from. Outside of her catapults, which any character can use once they are set up, she's almost as close to a Wilson clone as you can get. She has the same hunger, HP, and sanity stats, deals and takes the same damage, and her only two non-catapult perks that are relevant are more convenient than they are game-changing. Crafting faster feels nice, but I wouldn't call it something that distinguishes her from the way any other characters play the game. Being able to avoid Charlie is something that I'd imagine only affects very new players, who are still struggling to deal with darkness. So a Winona boss rush revolves entirely around the catapults. Catapults are good, but after she sets them up, literally any other character can use them. This is why I think Winona is widely perceived as boring. Once you upgrade the Florid Pustern, we players don't really associate Winona's catapults with Winona, since they aren't exclusive to her. Imagine if any other character could summon Abigail as long as they had Abigail's flower. That would make Wendy a boring swap out character as well, because why play her when you can get the best of both worlds with literally anyone else? The only situations where the swap out mentality does not apply is in friendly games, public servers, and solo boss rushes. If you manage to get a bunch of friends to sit down and play DST, in my experience, it's highly unlikely that you're going to get the same group of friends to sit down another time to continue the world. The same is true for public servers. These will start on day one, people will join throughout autumn, and everyone will typically leave during winter, or if you're lucky, spring. After everyone leaves, the next guy who joins the server will reset it, and the cycle just repeats. Since these types of worlds don't last that long, it makes swapping from Monona to another character really impractical. You simply don't have enough time to get to the point where you've set up all the catapults you want to, plus explore the map, set up a base, prepare for winter, etc. Because the game just ends. Even worse, you probably won't have the option to character swap since the Celestial Orb might not even spawn before you're done playing. The same is true for boss rushing. Since you're trying to beat bosses quickly, it makes no sense to set up Winona's catapults and then swap to another character, because you're going to have to set up all of the catapults for every boss fight first, swap to another character, and then start actually fighting the bosses. It's extremely impractical. Not to mention, it might not even be an option due to the Celestial Orb not spawning. In these three situations, I'd argue Winona's catapults are effectively exclusive to her and no one else. This, in my opinion, makes her a lot more interesting to play. Of course, since this is an S-tier Winona guide, I'm going to be going over how to boss rush using Winona's unique abilities. I am really surprised by how fun it was. It's not as straightforward as build a bunch of catapults and win. You have to figure out how to effectively place them, how to get the enormous amounts of rocks to make the cats, what kind of generator you need to use for each situation, how to obtain the fuel freeze generator, and how to actually fight the bosses with the catapults. There's also a pretty neat thing that, to my knowledge, only Winona can do, which ends up severely boosting her damage and defenses for the rest of the run. So if you're interested enough to stick around and watch Winona gameplay, then allow me to present my guide on how to be an S tier Winona. Before we start the run, let's go over the basics of Winona real quick. Being Charlie's sister, she has the incredible ability to dodge Charlie's first attack. This literally does not affect my gameplay in the slightest. Her second ability is the faster crafting speed, which, at the initial cost of 5 hunger, lets her craft twice as fast as a regular character so long as her hunger is above 50. If it's below 50, she takes twice as long to craft things. It's a nice ability, and I will be taking advantage of this, but there's nothing really to this other than just keeping her hunger above 50 whenever you want to craft stuff. Next are her craftables. Trusty tape requires 3 grass and 1 silk, and is required for all of Anona's structures. It can also be used as a sewing kit, which came in handy during the run, when my thermal stone was at 13% durability. Winona can build 4 structures. The most useless one is obviously the spotlight. It's pretty expensive because it costs fireflies, and is in my opinion a direct downgrade to the miner's hat, lantern, star collar staff, or campfire in almost every situation. Unsurprisingly, I'm not gonna use this because it sucks. The other structure is Winona's catapults. These obviously are what her playstyle will revolve around. They are also quite expensive, costing 1 trusty tape, 3 twigs, and a whopping 15 rocks each. This is the reason why Winona's nickname is the Rock Eater. Catapults have 400 HP and a passive regeneration of 8.3 HP every 10 seconds. They hurl rocks that deal 42.5 AoE damage, have a pretty large range, and attack at a rate of about once every 2.5 seconds. In order for the catapults to work, they need to be powered by a generator. The regular generator requires 1 trusty tape, 2 logs, and 2 niter. They are also powered by niter, which refuels the generator by about half. These are good, but they can't sustain a lot of cats, since their fuel capacity is pretty low. So limit the amount of cats per generator, or be prepared to refuel them mid-fight. The second type of generator is called a gemerator. This one costs 1 trusty tape, 2 boards, and 2 electrical doodads. They're the same as the regular generator, except they take gems instead of niter, and last way longer. So these are typically the ones you want to go with, since the raid bosses have a ton of HP. Anyways, that's the basics of Winona. Let's finally get into the guide. Like all the other S-tier character guides, we have no choice but to tame a beeflo. 
Not only do they give you a huge advantage when it comes to exploring the map, but if you're not playing Wolfgang or Walter, you're going to be moving like a snail whenever you're trying to assemble the shadow pieces. If you don't know how to tame one, I covered in my video called How to Actually Tame a Beefalo. So as soon as you spawn in, you want to pick the usual grass, twigs, and also get at least two flint for a pickaxe. After you have that, head to the mosaic biome and start mining rocks. You want to get at least 11 gold because that's enough to craft an alchemy engine, beefalo bell, and the saddle. In addition to this, you should also mine some regular boulders from Niter, since we will be using the regular generator during this run. After you get all that, try and find the beefalo while hammering any pig heads or at least two pig houses along the way. You should also chop down two fully grown trees since they'll give you six logs, which is enough for two science machines if you decide to hammer the first one. After you get the science machine, make a beefalo bell, razor, and a shovel. Once you find the beefalo, bind it to the bell and keep its hunger above zero for the first day by feeding it twigs, berries, green or blue mushrooms, and carrots. You're going to be feeding your beefalo and making catapults so Winona needs a lot of saplings at her base. I recommend digging up 30. If you have some time before night, open up a sinkhole to grab saplings, cut grass, mushrooms for your beefalo, and most important of all, light bulbs. Once night falls, shave two beefalo other than the one you are taming. If you shave the one that you are taming, you're going to have a lot of problems riding it until it grows its fur back. With the 6 wool you got from the shave the beefalo, you have everything you need to make the saddle. So after placing your alchemy engine, craft a saddle, a football helmet, and a lantern. Since trusty tape costs 3 grass, you should set up base near a large source of grass tufts. I end up basing pretty close to the beefalo savanna biome. With the saddle, football helmet, lantern, and all my saplings planted, I'm ready to explore the map. Like usual, I'm on the lookout for the suspicious marble pieces and their set piece, as well as the Pig King pan flute and the terrarium. In addition to that, I want to destroy almost all the spider dens that I come across since trusty tape requires silk, and I don't want to backtrack later in the run to kill spiders. Finally, you want to preferably craft a golden pickaxe and mine rocks when you get the chance. I think around 3 full stacks of rocks before you go into the caves is a pretty solid amount. After searching about 80% of the map, I locate all the suspicious marble pieces and have them assembled by day 9. As Winona, it's important to assemble the pieces before day 11, because come day 11, you want to mine the statues during the full moon in order to obtain the knight, bishop, and rook figure sketches. Mining the pieces on a full moon produces the normal clockworks and a figure sketch, so you don't need to actually beat the clockworks. Just grab the sketches and get out of there. After making a potter's wheel, put the sketches into the structure and craft one rook statue, one bishop statue, and at least 10 knight statues. I think I went with 13 for this run. I placed the knight sketches on a boat, and make 4 catapults powered by a regular generator so that the knights are in range of the cats. You probably know why we're doing this, but if you don't, I'll explain this when I come back here on day 21. After you're done setting up the pieces, grab your living logs, craft a piggyback for extra space, make sure you have a golden axe and pickaxe, and then head to the caves. While in the caves, we have basically 4 objectives. The first is to do a regular ruins rush, the second is to get at least 6 stacks of rocks, the third is to locate toadstool, and fourth is to get the 8 fossil fragments. Of course, ruins rushing using the beefalo is a breeze, since you can just run past all your problems at super speed. To make finding the ancient guardian easy, I craft a Thulisite medallion which reveals his location on the map. I also get an orange gem and craft a lazy forager before fighting AG. After I got the forager, I locate the labyrinth and start the AG fight. Remember when I said one of my cave objectives was to get a ton of rocks? Well, this is where all those rocks will be coming from. Every time AG runs into a pillar, it not only causes a mini earthquake that drops a few minerals, but it also drops large pillar fragments from the ceiling. These large fragments actually drop rocks when they are either mined, rammed by AG, or destroyed by other fragments that fall in the same place. So our goal is simply to get AG to round the pillars as frequently as possible, because every time he does this, his arena produces a bunch of rocks. Not only that, but the mini earthquake produces things like gems and niter, two minerals that we'll need to power our generators in the future. Picking up minerals the normal way would take a long time, especially if you're riding a beefalo. However, since we got the lazy forager, we can rapidly collect all of it while not slowing down our ability to bait AG into pillars. After doing this for about an entire game day, I have about 5 stacks of rocks and 60 niter. At this point, I start to fight AG for real and end up beating him on day 17.
of the fight, I have acquired 9 full stacks of rocks, 11 red gems, 24 niter, and 7 blue gems, all from minerals that AG produced by ramming into the pillars. With that, I have all the rocks and generator fuel I'll need for the run. I got a Starcaller staff and a Magi, but no luck with the Lazy Explorer, so I'll need to go hunting for Mac Tusks later. Since I had an inventory filled to the brim with rocks, I decided to leave the fossil fragments for later and left the caves after locating Toadstool. Since it was only day 18, I had a little time before the Shadow Piece fight on day 21. I used this time to beat the first raid boss and one of Winona's greatest matchups, Bee Queen. It wouldn't be surprising that many non Winona players have farmed Bee Queen with catapults in a long term world. However, for a boss rush, we don't have the time to place a billion catapults around the arena. Instead, we have to be a little efficient with our resources. The way I like to beat Bee Queen is two generators side by side, each with 7 catapults. 2 times 7 is 14, and at 15 rocks per cat, you're looking at more than 5 full stacks of rocks to make this entire setup. 5 stacks is nothing to us, since we got 9 from AG, and we can get a bunch of rocks back from the Shadow Pieces fight if need be. Anyways, once the cats are all set up, I fully load each generator and hammer the Bee Queen's hive. Even with a sea of catapults, the typical strat is to tank Bee Queen with armor and healing. However, it takes time and resources to get all that stuff, so we're going to go the efficient route and just dodge her instead. With your beefalo super speed, you want to do your best to lure her so that she's in the middle of both generators. This way she'll be in range of all 14 cats. In phases 1 and 2, Bee Queen will fly right up to you and try to sting you. All you need to do is stand in place, wait for her to get in range, and then dodge it. Your beefalo only has 1000 HP, so you can get hit a bunch, but your role is not to deal damage or tank her. Your role is to position Bee Queen so that your cats can deal their maximum damage. Phase 3 and 4, Bee Queen will keep her distance from you and will hover in place while her minions chase you down. This is way easier, since dodging her is substantially more difficult than dodging her minions. All you need to do is get her in the middle of the generators and run circles around her when she screams. The Grumbles will all focus you while the cats melt her. Honestly, phases 3 and 4 should be much faster than phases 1 and 2. Queen is one of the hardest bosses in the game, but since Winona is such a great matchup, the Queen dies in about 4 minutes. With that, I turn all the Royal Jelly into Jelly Beans, and I get ready for the start of winter. Since I don't have a Lazy Explorer, I tried to get a Tusk, but after killing 3 Walruses, I still had none. I got back to all the figure sketches we made before the night of Day 21, because we're about to start the Shadow Pieces fight. This right here is where half the fun of playing Winona comes from. When night falls, hammer the Rook or Bishop statue to start the fight. All the Knight statues will become alive, but since the knights can't teleport, they won't be able to cross over from ocean to land. This means as long as you keep your distance, you can't be hurt by them. As for the other two, you want to kill the bishop first and then the rook. Make sure you kill the pieces close enough to each other because if you don't, the others won't level up. After the bishop dies, the rook and the knights will level up to two. You'll seriously need to make sure you don't get too close to the knights. They not only have increased range, but they now deal 90 damage each. 10 plus knights will hit you for at least 900 damage, which means your beeflo is basically dead. As for the rook, he deals 100 damage per hit, but he's only one enemy, and beeflo speed makes him easy to dodge. Just make sure that he's not hitting your catapults with his teleport, because 5 hits and they'll be destroyed. After beating the Rook, all the Knights will level up to 3. Be extremely careful around these guys. Not only do they have a deceptively large range, but each deals 150 damage, so you're looking at instant death if you get into the range. Luckily for you, you can kill them without getting near. Go to your generator, fill it with Niter, and just sit back as your 4 catapults slowly kill the Knights. 
Each knight has 8,100 HP, and your cats are collectively dealing about 68 damage per second, so you'll be there for about 2 minutes. After all the knights are vanquished, you're rewarded with a ton of loot. Each knight drops a dark sword, a knight armor, and 4 to 6 nightmare fuel. The dark sword is a top tier weapon dealing 68 damage per hit with 100 uses. The knight armor is a top tier armor with 525 durability and blocks an incredible 95% of incoming damage. Since you now have an enormous supply of the best weapons and armor in the game, as well as the best healing item in the game from Bee Queen, you're ready to take on the rest of the bosses. The first one we're going to try out our new equipment on is Dragonfly. We're not going to use catapults against Dragonfly because I don't think it's necessary at all. We're going to be fighting her the normal way. However, since we have a ton of Dark Swords, Knight Armor, and Jelly Beans, the fight is just way easier than it would be with a normal character. Dark Swords and Knight Armor do drain your sanity, but the Dragonfly Desert has a bunch of cactus, so I just spend a bit of time before the fight to pick them. After I set up the walls and remember to bring the Pan Flute, the fight is started. It's the same as with any other character, just way faster since you have a top tier weapon and way more comfortable since the 95% damage reduction of Knight Armor means Dragonfly is doing less than 4 damage to you per slap. Usually you'd hit Dragonfly 6 times and then dodge, however I'm using animation cancelling, so I'm able to consistently get 7 hits in. If you fight Dragonfly the typical way, which is a handbat and no animation cancelling, you'll end up doing about 357 damage before you have to dodge. Since I'm using only Dark Swords and animation cancelling, I'm doing 476 damage in between slaps, which is a 33% increase, a stronger damage buff than even Wakefred. After Dragonfly goes to spawn Lava, I swap to the Magi and use the Thulicite Club to chase her down to do extra damage to her. Once she only has a few more Lava to spawn, I hurry back to the outside of the wall and wait for her to attack again. Once her last lava dies, she'll either fly away to spawn more, or she'll enrage. If she flies away, just chase her down again to deal extra damage. If she enrages, just blow the pan flute and attack her again. After almost a day of fighting, Dragonfly dies, which makes the third raid boss down. The next one on the list will be the Twins of Terror. Now in this run, I didn't do a good job with the Twins. I did beat them, but I ended up getting most of my catapults destroyed by Spasmatism, which severely crippled Winona's effectiveness against them. Basically what you want to do against the Twins is summon them quite a bit away from the Bee Queen catapults, put them both to sleep, and then lure Spasmatism to the cats. Then you want to fight Spasmatism around the catapults and position yourself so that he charges at you and doesn't hit your cats. I did this right in the Winona boss rush that I live streamed. The key is to get the first hit on Spasmatism after his charge ends. If you hit him first, then he will go after you. If your catapults hit him instead, he will probably go after them. The catapults are a huge help, not just because they greatly increase your DPS, but because their splash damage means you can almost ignore the peepers. Since positioning yourself in order to direct the twins' charges is such an important part of the fight, I use the beefalo instead of fighting on foot, since I'm just way faster on the beefalo. The 
Catapults are a big help against Spazmatism, but they really shine against Redonazer since it tends to spawn Peepers more often than Spaz, which means the splash damage is much more impactful, and Res tends to stand in place longer, meaning it gets hit a lot more frequently by the cats. You definitely want to fight the twins after you fight Bee Queen, since even if you do everything right, there is a chance of your cats getting destroyed. However, depending on how much rocks, twigs, and tape you have, the twins destroying your catapults might be a good thing, since destroying them returns half the resources, meaning you'll have the stuff you need to build more for later bosses. Anyway, if the twins destroy most of the catapults, they simply won't be attacking enough to stop the peepers, so unfortunately in the actual run, I ended up fighting Spaz and Retinazer almost the same way as if I were playing Wes on a beefalo. With the twins out of the way, there's just one more boss to fight on the surface, and that's Kloss. Kloss falls into the same boat as Dragonfly. It would not only be a waste of time to set up catapults just for Kloss, but it would be really bad since the cats would probably kill the deer too. So I fight Kloss with Dark Swords, Night Armor, and Jelly Beans. The fight is exactly the same as fighting the default way, except you're killing him faster with Dark Swords, and you're taking almost no damage from his hits due to the Night Armor. Since my defenses were so high, I played pretty aggressively and got hit a bunch of times, but it doesn't really matter since each swipe is doing less than 2 damage. In phase 2, I have to swap the Knight Armor for the Magi, since I simply don't have the speed to dodge Kloss's pounce attack with the Knight Armor. After Kloss is defeated, I get his wax paper and the next day I fight Deer Clops, so I can make an umbrella. Then I spend about another day bundle wrapping the things I'll need for Toadstool, the Nightmare Wear Pig, and a Fuel Weaver. On the night of day 32, I enter the caves and start to set up for Toadstool. Toadstool is probably the funnest fight in the run for me. He has an enormous health pool, but that's not the biggest problem. The hardest thing about Toadstool is his spore caps. Every 45 seconds, he'll spawn 8 spore caps, each taking 10 chops with the normal axe to fell. The more spore caps are up, 
the stronger, faster, and beefier toadstool becomes, so you typically want to chop the spore caps down as fast as possible. The problem is that it's not spring yet, so weather panes are not available. Without weather panes, unless you're playing woody or are using glass axes, by the time your character is typically done chopping down spore caps, toadstool will be right about ready to spawn another round of them. This is true for Winona as well. However, it's also not a problem for her, because even if Winona is preoccupied with cutting down spore caps the entire time, her catapults will be dealing steady damage to Toadstool. If you're not smart about where you place your cats, Toadstool will just demolish them. Not only do all of his attacks deal massive damage, but they'll also be instantly destroyed if Toadstool so much as touches them. Because of this, you want to strategically place your cats in the same way I place them here. Note that you want to place them this way around the pond, that is the shortest distance from Toadstool's spawner. Placing them around the further ponds makes positioning Toadstool harder. Since Toadstool has such a huge health pool, you definitely want to go with gem raiders. So load them up with 3 gems each and chop Toadstool's cap to start the fight. Instead of attacking him, I will let him walk to you. Winona has 3 objectives in this fight. The first and by far the most important objective is to position Toadstool on the outside edge of the pond opposite your catapult setup. That right there is the sweet spot since all 8 of your catapults will be hitting Toadstool if he's there. The pawn will also be somewhat blocking him from walking back to the center, and Toadstool will be far enough away from your structures that they won't get destroyed. When he stops walking towards you and makes a beeline to the center, go full offense because he's not going to do anything to you for 15 seconds. After the 15 seconds are up, he'll spawn spore caps. When he does this, you definitely want to chop at least one of them before he finishes spawning. Toadstool gets a massive speed boost if 8 spore caps are up, which makes it really hard to do anything since he'll be right in your face all the time. So chop at least one before he's done spawning, so that you're not dealing with a max power toad. As for the rest of them, if the center of the arena is at 6 o'clock, I chop the trees in a counterclockwise direction. This tends to be the best way to keep Toadstool positioned at the sweet spot while you chop the trees. If you can't chop a tree down because it's in the middle of a spore cloud, it's okay. Even if Tolso has a little armor, cats are still doing good damage to it. Don't worry about dropping spore bombs onto your catapults because the cats are completely immune to that type of damage. That is basically it for the Tolso fight. Keep him at the sweet spot, chop the trees down, and attack him once he starts to walk back to the center. Since your cats are dealing constant damage, you don't need any special equipment for the fight. Just use golden axes to cut down the trees and dark swords to damage Toad. This strategy is so effective that Toadstool dies in just 8 minutes, which is pretty darn fast for a pre weather pain Toadstool fight. After Toadstool, the next boss would be the Nightmare Wear Pig. Unfortunately, there is literally nothing that Winona utilizes in this fight that is different from Wilson. I don't use Dark Swords since they are bundle wrapped, I don't use Knight Armor since the Magi is a better option for this fight, and definitely do not use Cats because they are way too expensive for this guy and would probably get destroyed. So I fight the Pig with a Beekeeper Hat, which reverses his Insanity Aura, the Magi for speed, and a Dark Sword slash the Sight Club. The fight went exactly as you would expect, nothing to see here.
After the Nightmare Were Pig, there's just one boss left, the Ancient Fuel Weaver. Before we go to the fight, we make a quick stop at the upgraded Pseudoscience Station to turn my walking cane into a lazy explorer and craft some Pseudocyte crowns. I also pick up the Ancient Key and Wooden Gate, and after spending a day to find the Atrium Bridge, I cheat into the Void and find the Atrium Gate. The Fuel Weaver is probably the toughest boss in the game. Unless you're really experienced in this fight, you typically will need to bring Weather Pains, else Fuel Weaver ends up healing thousands of HP from eating Woven Shadows. With Winona, Woven Shadows are basically a complete non-issue. When you get to the arena, you want to set up three generators, one in each corner of the arena that has a pillar. Each generator will be powering two catapults. Make sure that the cats are not placed inside the large circle, because they can be destroyed if a Woven Shadow spawns beneath them, and they might get hit by Fuel Weaver's Bone Spiral. Since you're only using two catapults, the regular generator is fine. Just make sure that they are fully powered at the start of the fight, and you have some nitre in your inventory in case you have to refuel them. Other than that, you want to have the same inventory setup as normal. Have a bunch of sanity food, a nightmare amulet, a lazy explorer, and strong armor and weapons. After maxing out my sanity with the Dwarf Star Sanity Station, I insert the Shadow Atrium to start the fight. Since you lose 40 sanity for summoning him, I immediately E3 Cook Cactus. After that, I just swing away with the Thulicite Club and Dark Sword. Winona's catapults really increase her DPS. If Fuel Weaver is in range of all 6 cats, they're dealing about 102 damage per second. Combine that with the damage she's doing and she's basically dealing Wolfgang damage. Phase 1 plays out the regular way. You can either dodge him or tank him, just make sure to keep the fight in the center of the arena and away from your structures. After his HP drops below 10,000, he'll enter phase 2 where he becomes invincible and summons Woven Shadows. This is the part that really proves Winona is the best character for fighting Fuel Weaver. Her 6 catapults AoE damage prevents any of the Woven Shadows from getting to Fuel Weaver, except maybe the ones that spawn directly under him. The catapult damage also stuns him for a moment, which slows him down allowing you to easily teleport around the arena and destroy the Hidden Hands. After the Hidden Hands are destroyed, just go to him and smack away. Since you have all that Knight Armor combined with the Thulocyte Crowns, this guy is only dealing 5 damage per hit which means jelly beans are all the healing you'll need. Sandy might be an issue if you let the fight drag on for too long, so just bring a lot of cooked cactus or bring the Bee Queen crown since it lets you gain tons of Sandy from Fuel Weaver's aura, and you'll still have 95% damage reduction if you're wearing the Night Armor. You probably won't have to refuel your generators mid-fight, but if you do, make sure to do it as quickly as possible and while Fuel Weaver is kind of far away, since he'll destroy your structures by walking over them. Also, do it right after he snares you, since the bones from a new snare might destroy your structures as well. That's basically it. Winona's cats are so good against this guy that they essentially remove Fuel Weaver's healing mechanic and turn Winona into Wolfgang. After a mere two and a half minute fight, Fuel Weaver is defeated on day 40. With that, we've beaten all the non-ocean raid bosses. That's Bee Queen, the Shadow Pieces, Dragonfly, the Twins of Terror, Kloss, Toadstool, and the Ancient Fuel Weaver. All beaten using methods that are pretty much unique to just Winona. And that is, in my opinion, how to be an S-tier Winona. Like I say all the time, if you're still around after this insanely long video, I truly appreciate your dedication to wanting to see gameplay from this character. Like mentioned at the start, I think Winona is fun, as long as you view her catapults as an ability that is exclusive to her. Boss rushing is a type of gameplay that effectively accomplishes that. So yeah, that's the end of the video. Like always, thanks for watching, take care, and have a great day.